a teenage girl from Fairfax County, Virginia, was lured to Lake Accotink Park in Springfield on January the 8th of 2017 under the false pretense of smoking marijuana. Upon her arrival at the meetup location, Damaris Reyes Rivas was confronted by 10 MS-13 gang members. They questioned the teen about the death of Christian Sosa Rivas, another MS-13 associate who had been killed about a week earlier. Damaris, who also had ties to the gang, was accused of luring Rivas to his death. The deceased man's girlfriend, identified as Venus Romero Irajita, reportedly spearheaded Damaris's interrogation. The gangsters forced the latter to remove her shirt and walk barefoot in the snow in order to make her feel as cold as Rivas did when his body was dumped in the river. The associates went on to record themselves as they viciously beat Damaris. Irahita, who allegedly sliced the victim's tattoo off her body, punctuated the tortuous ordeal by proclaiming, you're going to remember me until the day we see each other in hell. The 18-year-old then fatally stabbed Damaris, who was subsequently buried in her quinceanera dress. Investigators from both Fairfax County and the FBI eventually zeroed in on Irahita and her 10 accomplices, who were each arrested in connection with the brutal revenge killing. In disturbing footage of Irahita's police interrogation, the young woman recalled the murder in graphic detail. She openly admitted to subjecting the victim to agonizing torture before stabbing her to death. In November of 2018, Irahita was sentenced to 40 years behind bars for the crime. In court, it emerged that she and Damaris had grown up just miles from each other in El Salvador. The victim's mother had reportedly brought her to the United States in an attempt to escape the gang violence prevalent in their home country. Number 6. Jenna Margaret Interman on the evening of June the 23rd of 2016, a woman dressed in black entered the branch of RBC Royal Bank in northeast Calgary, Alberta, Canada. She approached the teller line and handed one of the workers a note demanding that the cash till be opened. The suspect then flashed what appeared to be a handgun concealed in her purse. Upon being given only $100, the woman left. In the incident's aftermath, law enforcement identified the female bank robber as 30-year-old Jenna Margaret Interman. A warrant was issued for her arrest on charges of robbery and possession of a weapon. At the time, Interman was also wanted in connection with an unrelated home burglary and theft, as well as a breach of release conditions, possession of marijuana, identity theft, and driving a motor vehicle while uninsured, among other offenses. In late August of 2016, police conducted a traffic stop in northeast Calgary. The occupants of the vehicle were identified as Interman, as well as a man by the name of Clayton McKay, aged 34. Officers subsequently moved to arrest the pair, but they resisted. During the ensuing scuffle, a female officer's ankle was reportedly broken, and both suspects consequently had a count of resisting arrest added to their lengthy list of criminal charges. Number 5. Diana Marini New York woman Diana Marini entered a branch of Chase Bank on Veterans Memorial Highway in the village of Islanda on Long Island on the afternoon of October the 28th of 2017. The 28-year-old handed the teller a note demanding cash and was subsequently given an undisclosed amount of money. Marini then left the bank and got into a taxi that was waiting outside for her. Suffolk County Police subsequently caught up with the cab and pulled it over, whereupon they found both Marini and her six-year-old daughter inside. The woman had reportedly left her child in a taxi outside the bank while she committed the robbery. She was arrested on charges of robbery and endangering the welfare of a child. While Marini spent the night behind bars at the 4th Precinct, the child was released to the custody of family members. It was reported that Child Protective Services had been notified of the situation, but no further updates were disclosed to the public. Number 4. Bonnie Gooch Authorities in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, received a tip about a robbery in progress at Goppert Financial Bank on April 5th of 2023. Upon arrival, responding officers were told that the suspect had already left. Witnesses were, however, able to provide a description of the suspect, an elderly woman, and the vehicle in which she had departed. Police subsequently spotted the car less than two miles from the bank and initiated a traffic stop. A search of the vehicle reportedly yielded evidence that the woman behind the wheel had in fact committed the robbery, as there was money strewn all over the floorboards. The suspect, identified as 78-year-old Bonnie Gooch, was consequently taken into custody on a charge of stealing or attempted stealing from a financial institution. According to subsequent reports, Gooch had handed one of the tellers a note that read, This is a robbery. I need 13,000 small bills. As shown in surveillance footage, 
The woman eventually pounded on the counter, telling the bank worker to hurry and give her the cash without counting it. In a note seized by the police as evidence, Gooch had also written, Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Before leaving, court records indicated that when she was subsequently pulled over, officers noted that she smelled strongly of alcohol. Following her arrest, it came to light that it wasn't the first time Gooch had been busted for robbing a bank. Back in 1977, she reportedly held up a bank in California and was ultimately convicted of the crime in court. In 2020, at the age of 75, Gooch was accused of robbing a bank in the Kansas City suburb of Lee's Summit. Her probation in connection with that heist ended in November of 2021. Number 3. Caitlin Armstrong A professional cyclist by the name of Anna Maria Wilson traveled to Austin, Texas, ahead of the Gravel Locos bike race in May of 2022. She was reportedly staying with a friend who came upon Wilson dead in her apartment on the night of May the 11th. Surveillance footage revealed that a vehicle belonging to 35-year-old Caitlin Armstrong had pulled up outside the homes shortly before Wilson was gunned down. Discharged rounds recovered from the crime scene would later be matched to Armstrong's 9mm handgun. A week after the shooting, a warrant was issued for Armstrong's arrest. By that time, however, the woman had already fled to New York. After a month-long manhunt, authorities finally tracked her down to Santa Teresa, Costa Rica, in late June. U.S. Marshals subsequently brought Armstrong, a yoga teacher by trade, back to Texas to stand trial for Wilson's murder. She pleaded not guilty during a hearing in July with the trial, originally slated to begin in October of 2022. However, following a series of postponements, the defense team secured yet another delay as they continued to gather evidence. A new start date was then scheduled for October the 30th of 2023, as the case languished in court. Details emerged regarding the likely motive for the homicide. The victim had reportedly been having a fling with Armstrong's then-boyfriend, Colin Strickland. Armstrong learned of the affair and decided to eliminate her love rival outright. The shooting unfolded just moments after Strickland had dropped Wilson off at her apartment following a night of swimming at Deep Eddy Pool in Austin. Number 2. Brienne Basarich A 31-year-old exotic dancer from Lakeland, Florida, came under law enforcement scrutiny after posting several threats of extreme violence online under the Tumblr username Taking Lives. The individual in question, identified as Brienne Basarich, repeatedly expressed homicidal urges in her social media blogs. In one post, she stated she was pretty excited about her plans to purchase an AR-15, as well as other firearms. She described a vision she'd allegedly experienced about a venue with only one way in and out, where she fantasized about committing a mass shooting. In the same vein, Basarich openly expressed her admiration for serial killers and mass murderers, while professing her love for the true crime genre as well. The woman who stood five feet and one inch tall on a 135 pound frame was at work when her mother called her and asked her to come home one day in January of 2019. When she arrived at her Elon Crescent residence, she was taken into police custody on a felony charge of written threats to kill, do bodily injury, or conduct a mass shooting. Basarich was subsequently booked at the Polk County Jail before being released on a $5,000 bond. The woman had reportedly worked at Showgirls Men's Club in Plant City leading up to her arrest. During a press conference, a police spokesman indicated that Basarich did not actually pose a direct threat to the public despite her online pontifications. We have our earlier video about when evil partners go wrong lined up for you after number one. In case you feel like informing yourself of a few more cases with some truly evil people involved. Number 1. Kathleen Ann Solaya On April the 21st of 1975, the Crocker National Bank in Carmichael, California, was robbed by members of the militant far-left organization known as the Symbionese Liberation Army. During the course of the robbery, one of the armed suspects inadvertently discharged her shotgun leading to the death of a mother of four who'd been depositing money for her church. Another one of the robbers, identified as Kathleen Ann Salia, allegedly kicked a pregnant teller in the abdomen, causing her to suffer a miscarriage.
Police later raided Salia's room at the SLA safe house in San Francisco where they found a 9mm pistol as well as ammunition that appeared to match similar cartridges found in the body of the woman who'd been gunned down during the robbery. A few months later, a bomb that came perilously close to detonating was discovered underneath an LAPD patrol car that had been parked in front of an IHOP. Another bomb was subsequently found beneath a squad car outside a police station about a mile away. Salia was accused of planting the bombs to avenge SLA members who'd been killed in a shootout with police the previous year. After being indicted by a grand jury for the pipe bomb plantings, Salia went underground. She assumed the alias Sarah Jane Olson and remained a fugitive for the next 23 years. While on the run, she moved to Minnesota, married a physician and gave birth to three daughters. In 1999, Salia was featured on the TV series America's Most Wanted, which generated a tip to the authorities that ultimately led to her capture that June. She pleaded guilty to two counts of possessing explosives with intent to murder but continued to publicly profess her innocence. In 2002, Salia was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The following year, she reached a plea deal in connection with the deadly shooting committed during the Crocker National Bank robbery. She was consequently hit with an additional six-year sentence to be served concurrently with her 14-year sentence. Despite never publicly expressing regret or remorse for her various misdeeds, Celia was released after serving only half her prison term. In the years that followed, the former political extremist largely stayed out of the headlines. However, she was arrested in November of 2020 after participating in a march on Interstate 94 in Minnesota following the US presidential election. In the end, she was ordered to pay a small fine. Number 7. Gareth Purse House Los Angeles police were dispatched to a home in West Hollywood in the early hours of February the 15th of 2020. After they'd received reports of a woman screaming when officers arrived, they came upon 38-year-old marriage and family therapist Amy Harwick lying unconscious on the ground below the house's third-floor balcony. She'd been left badly injured after an apparent fall, and upon being taken to the hospital, she was pronounced dead. The ensuing police investigation determined that on the night of her death, Harwick had been strangled and thrown from the balcony after being ambushed by her ex-boyfriend, Gareth Pursehouse. The victim had previously filed multiple restraining orders against the man, whom she accused of inflicting repeated physical abuse during the course of their relationship. The day after Harwick was killed, Pursehouse was taken into custody on charges of murder with the special circumstance of lying in wait, breaking and entering and home burglary. He posted his $2 million bail and was released, then re-arrested a couple of months later after entering a not guilty plea. Purse House's preliminary hearing date was originally set to take place in the summer of 2020, but after a series of delays and postponements, the proceedings were rescheduled for October the 25th of 2022. Number 6. Larissa Schuster In 2002, California couple Tim and Larissa Schuster went through an acrimonious divorce process that involved fighting over the custody of their son, Tyler, as well as the splitting of their joint assets. Larissa was ultimately awarded primary custody of Tyler, while her estranged husband was forced to move into a condominium in Clovis. At some point during the summer of 2002, the woman allegedly told a friend of hers, I want my husband dead. You don't understand. I could do it and get away with it. Her sinister remarks foreshadowed the events of July the 9th of 2003, when Larissa and her co-worker, James Fagon, lured Tim from his condo before using chloroform and a stun gun to incapacitate him. The woman and her accomplice then disposed of the victim's unconscious body in a 55-gallon barrel filled with hydrochloric acid in an attempt to dissolve his remains. Despite their efforts to erase evidence of the crime, Larissa immediately became the focus of Clovis Police's investigation into Tim's sudden disappearance. Investigators eventually interviewed Fagon, who openly revealed the grisly details of Tim's murder when pressed by detectives. Larissa was arrested at St. Louis Airport while on vacation with her son. Both she and Fagon were charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder. Following their trials, they each received life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 5. 
Patrick Morris Simmons. On the morning of March the 15th of 2022, Minnesota police were sent to a St. Paul shipping warehouse on the 1700 block of Wynn Avenue for a report of a woman on fire. Responding officers found 44-year-old Kelly Goodemont in critical condition after having sustained severe burns all over her body. Paramedics pronounced her dead at the scene a short time later. Investigators quickly identified the victim's ex-boyfriend as their prime suspect. 47-year-old Patrick Morris Simmons was located a short distance from his home in Bloomington, which had been set ablaze. He was initially arrested on arson charges, but then transported to the St. Paul Police Department as part of the homicide investigation into Goodemont's death. It subsequently emerged that the woman had been stabbed in the neck before being doused with gasoline and set alight by Simmons, who later called her a witch to detectives. He further indicated that he'd carried out the brutal attack on his ex to stand up for the babies being killed and sacrificed with witchcraft. Simmons also explained that he'd burned his own house down because there had been paranormal activity going on inside. In May of 2022, the man was found incompetent to stand trial for second-degree murder and his next court hearing was scheduled for November. Number 4. Eric Bretz in September of 2018, after posting a picture of herself in a black spaghetti strap tank top to Instagram, college student Melissa Gentz was viciously attacked by her socialite boyfriend. The 22-year-old woman, a Brazilian native studying at the University of South Florida, was both verbally and physically abused over the photograph, which 25-year-old Eric Bretz considered to have been too revealing. After the man had become argumentative and jealous, he allegedly took Gens' cell phone, to which she responded by pushing him. Bretz then turned violent, throwing his girlfriend to the floor and strangling her with his legs before pulling out chunks of her hair and hitting her in the face with a bottle of wine. The victim eventually fled to the apartment building's lobby where a doorman called the police. In the aftermath, Gens posted pictures of her bruised and battered face to Instagram with the caption, I won't hide the marks of my story because no woman should feel ashamed or feel blamed for being a victim of domestic violence. Bretz, the son of one of Brazil's wealthiest families, was arrested on a charge of felony domestic battery by strangulation, to which he pleaded not guilty after his attorney indicated that he was eager to prove his innocence. He was released from custody on $60,000 bail, agreeing to a restraining order that prohibited him from making any form of contact with Gens. The following month, the latter released audio clips that she claimed had come from the night of their altercation. In the recordings, she could be heard crying while a man believed to be Brett's screamed, Why are you so dumb? and you do not accept the man who has more dominance than you. As of recent updates, the case's legal proceedings hadn't yet reached a conclusion. Number 3. Brett Walker At around midday on July the 9th of 2022, police were called to a home in Nowra on the south coast of New South Wales after receiving reports of a domestic violence incident. Upon their arrival, officers found 25-year-old Sky Crookshank bleeding profusely from the neck, and she was then rushed to St. George Hospital where her condition was stabilized. The woman had reportedly been viciously attacked by her abusive partner, 27-year-old Brett Walker, who was still brandishing a large knife when police came on the scene. He threatened the officers before charging towards them, at which point he was fatally shot by law enforcement. When paramedics arrived, they performed CPR on him, but he was ultimately pronounced dead a short time later. Crookshank's brother-in-law also sustained minor injuries during the altercation after attempting to intervene on her behalf, and he was taken to Shoalhaven Hospital in the aftermath. It was reported that the woman was set to be discharged from the hospital a few days after the incident occurred. The ill-fated couple had initially gotten together the previous month shortly after Walker had been released from prison in Victoria and moved to the Shoalhaven area. Number 2. Charlotte Dutson 
English woman Charlotte Dootson, a drug addict with a documented personality disorder, subjected her boyfriend to a harrowing campaign of domestic abuse over the course of their four-year relationship. Between May of 2018 and July of 2021 alone, Manchester police received a total of 12 calls about Dootson, inflicting violence against Mohammed Mukhtar. She allegedly assaulted him on a regular basis, often using weapons such as knives and had even caused him to be hospitalized twice. Although Dootson was arrested on three separate occasions, Mukhtar would either lie to protect the abusive woman or refuse to support a prosecution each time the authorities became involved. The couple's tempestuous relationship was brought to an appalling and violent conclusion. In August of 2021, 25-year-old Dootson reportedly bound her gentle and vulnerable partner to a sofa using electrical cables wrapped around his hands, feet and neck. She proceeded to humiliate Mukhtar even further by sending a picture of him tied up to another would-be lover, which was followed by a slew of sadomasochistic messages. Hours later, Dootson called her father to tell him that Mukhtar was no longer breathing. He urged her to contact emergency medical services, but she refused and instead left the house. After the police conducted a welfare check on Mukhtar on August the 30th, they came upon his bound body and he was ultimately pronounced dead at the scene. Dootson was arrested shortly thereafter and later pleaded guilty to murder for which she was jailed for life, with a minimum term of 22 and a half years before she could be considered for conditional release. Number 1. Catherine Knight In February of 2000, an Australian couple's already tumultuous relationship grew even more tenuous following a series of domestic assaults, which culminated with Catherine Knight stabbing her boyfriend, John Price in the chest. The man consequently kicked Knight out of the house and took out a restraining order against her, seeking to keep her away from both him and his children. On February the 29th, Price reportedly told his co-workers that if he didn't come to work the following day, it would be because Knight had killed him. That night, the woman visited his house while he was sleeping and took a shower before waking him up to have intimate relations. A neighbor became concerned the next morning after seeing Price's car still in the driveway. The police were alerted when the neighbor found blood on the front door, and after breaking in through the back of the house, officers came upon Price's mutilated body as well as night, comatose from a large number of pills. The bloody scene was the reported aftermath of a gruesome killing carried out by Knight. During the course of the previous night, she'd stabbed her ex-boyfriend with a butcher knife, and although he attempted to escape, his wounds ultimately proved too severe and he bled out. Several hours later, the sadistic woman skinned, decapitated, and dismembered Price's remains before cooking parts of his body to serve alongside baked potato, pumpkin, beetroot, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. Knight allegedly planned to serve the man's organs to his children the following night. The woman initially offered to plead guilty to a reduced charge of manslaughter but was rejected. Despite refusing to accept responsibility for her actions, Knight ultimately pleaded guilty to murder and was consequently sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. The first Australian woman to receive such a punishment. Thanks for watching. Would you rather have a good relationship with your mum but also have an evil stepmother or no mother at all? Let us know in the comment section below.